Argentina. Oh, Argentina. Uh, Argentina. Okay, thank you all for coming. So the important point, I hope you got this at the end of the class yesterday, is that we, we spent a lot of time talking about the neshama, that the neshama is a chalik elokah mimal mamish, it's a part of God. <coughs> Excuse me. The neshama being a part of God doesn't need to get fixed. Hashem doesn't need to get fixed. So what's the neshama doing here? The neshama is here to fix the world. Because the godliness in the world became hidden and covered over through creation and alone. That the word, creation hides godliness. The word for a world, it means hiding. Like we discussed this in great detail. The neshama to express itself, this is ana. The neshama to express itself, however, needs garments. Just like when you get up in the morning, you put on your garment, you go to the wardrobe and you choose your garments and your garments make a statement about you. Your garments in here are not the same. Most of you girls, I presume, went to college, college. And the garments you wear in college, everybody wears a uniform. Uniform is jeans and sneakers and a t-shirt. That's college uniform. On a formal day. What? I said on a formal day. On a formal day, right. And you chose a different, you came here, you chose a different uniform, different garments. Your garments make a statement about you. The garments of the soul through which the soul expresses itself are the way you act, the way you speak, and the way you think. The three garments of the soul. Action, speech, and thought. <clears throat> A more refined person will have more refined garments. Nicer garments. Nicer in whose eyes? Nicer in one's own eyes. When you got used to wearing modest garments, maybe at first you didn't think they were so nice. And you got nicer ones. And your garments should be not, you want your garments to be nice in everybody's eyes. <clears throat> you have special garments for Shabbos and special garments for Yontif. Special garments for when you go to the oil. Some people have exquisite garments. Some people have very plain garments. They don't have good taste. So similarly in our activities, the way we behave, some people behave with a lot of grace. They're very gracious. They're very warm. They make other people feel welcome. They make other people feel good. Some people come into a room. They just come into a room and they radiate. Charisma. Some people talk rough, abrupt. Some people don't like to talk at all. Some people talk too much. Some people speak very arrogantly, even though they don't mean, they don't, they don't want to be arrogant, they don't want to be, like, but it just comes across anyway, that they think very highly of themselves, they think that they're very special. They give people a feeling that they look down on them, the other, uh, other people give everybody the feeling that they look up to them. They make them feel important. Many, many times you hear people who have Yechidus with the Rebbe, the first thing they say is, he made me feel very comfortable. <coughs> that's, that's a real gift. 
to make people feel at ease, to make them feel confidence, to make them feel trust. All this has to do with the garments of speech and, the, and together with the garments of action, how you move, how you gesture, how you welcome a person. You know, as a person came to the Rebbe the first time, he came into the Rebbe's room and the Rebbe offered him a seat. It was his first time ever alone in, in the Rebbe's room. The Rebbe said, have a seat. He said, my Rebbe, my, my, my Shlia told me I shouldn't sit down. So the Rebbe extended his hand to him. As my Shlia said, I shouldn't shake hands with the Rebbe. So the Rebbe took his hand and he said, you could sit down. We won't tell your Shlia. <laughs> And he felt right away. And the Rebbe had this uncanny ability of making everybody feel completely accepted and at home. And it was, it, that's why it's called Yechidus. They felt very intimately connected to the Rebbe. And then there are garments of thought. Some people think nice things about life. They think nice things about other people. They think nice things about what they're doing. And of course, that affects their activities and affects their life. And other people are bitter. They have an excess of black bile in their system. Like we learned in chapter one, a predominance of earthiness in their character, which comes across in the way they think. And the way they think affects the way they talk. These are the garments of the soul. So we learned in the end of the last chapter that parents want, their, want to endow their children with a good education. Of course, we want my child to go to the best schools. There's a shlich in Manhattan. He has a preschool for three-year-olds. And parents line up to get into his preschool because they think if he gets get into this preschool, they're going to get into the next one. And then, they're, then, then their children will go to Yale and Harvard. I kid you not. And they pay big money. So we want the best for our children. So therefore, the, it says in the Zohar, a person has to sanctify himself. A woman has to sanctify herself when, they make, when they're make, raising a family, creating a family, to endow the children with good garments, sensitive garments, sensitive to what? Sensitive to other people sensitive to spiritual values, sensitive to the difference between right and wrong, sensitive to godliness. So how do you do that? Give charity. That's a good way. Be nice to other people, especially. Somebody just told me there's a custom in Jerusalem. We saw the birds flying around. He said, when a, a young man and a young woman get married in Jerusalem, after Cheder Yichud, they go out and feed the birds. Custom in Jerusalem. They feed the birds. Start their married life with kindness. Learn a sicha. Learn a mimer. At least it's in the back of your mind and it affects your whole outlook. And this is in order to that your children should also, that their outlook should be affected in a good way, in a positive way. They should have a positive attitude about life and about others and about Torah and mitzvahs and Hashem and our Jewish destiny and our Jewish life. These are the garments of the soul. And then, then the, 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 Tanya goes on to remind us what it says there, that these garments are crucial to our life because the garments that we give to our children, are, they're stuck with them for life. And all the mitzvahs they're gonna do have to go through those garments. Everything they're going to learn and everything they're going to do and all the business and all their personal interactions with others are going to go through those same garments. 
And if you don't like your garments, to change them is a, a lot of work. To change them, even the slightest amount, is a lifetime's work to edel out. You know what the word edel, edel means refined. To refine your garments even a little bit. And that's what we work on now. I'm uh, digressing a little bit. That's what we work on when we say Krishna at night before you go to sleep. That's the time to really work on, not in class. And if you're working, not when you're working, that's not the time for introspection. The time for introspection and working on your garments is before you go to sleep at night. The only problem is you're usually too tired. <laughs> you had too many other things you want to finish before you went to sleep, and then you're too tired to think to work on yourself. You thought about everything, you didn't think about yourself. And he goes on to say more. Let's say the Alta Baba, the Baba of the Baba, or the Alta, 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 Alta Zayda, looks down on you, his great granddaughter, her great granddaughter, and wants the best for her, and says, Hashem, Hashem, I have a great granddaughter. And I, I don't want her to get lost in Golis. There are many temptations and distractions in life in the world, especially now more than ever before. Please, Hashem, look after her. In the, whatever merit I had for what I did when I was here, when I was down there, it should go in her, should be for her that she should have an inspiration to be a good girl. And Hashem says, done. You deserve it, and, and you got it. And you feel, chaya, chaya. And you feel an inspiration. You don't know where it came from. You, you feel it. So even an inspiration, the Tanya concludes, even that kind of a thing, an inspiration that you didn't work for, an inspiration, you didn't plan on it like you planned on uh, keeping Shabbos, you planned on keeping a co making your house kosher, you planned on getting new mezuzahs, you planned, you worked on it, but you have an inspiration, you know, you didn't do anything, it just came. Where did it come from? It came from uh, the intercession maybe of an ancestor who interceded on your behalf. That also has to come through the same garments. So it's very, very important <coughs> To, to endow a child with the best possible garments. Sensitive, beautiful, kosher garments of thought and speech and action that the child will go through life with these garments and achieve good things. So we see that there's two very important levels here. There's the neshama itself and there's the garments of the neshama. And he concludes that sometimes it can happen that a very, very high neshama, a lofty neshama of a tzaddik, a great person, comes down to be a child of very coarse, unrefined people. People who are not careful about the way they speak, they speak rough, they speak insensitive, they say things you're not supposed to say, a lot of Lashon Hara, they're interested in things that are the opposite of Torah and mitzvahs. And a child is born into a family like that who have no use for Torah and Yiddishkeit, or Torah and mitzvahs, and comes into this family, a beautiful, beautiful, holy neshama. What's it doing in this family? Why wasn't it born into a family of righteous parents? As we find that the Mittler Rebbe was born from the Alter Rebbe and from the Alter Rebbe's wife, very holy, righteous people. Is it any wonder that he had a holy, righteous neshama that was extremely, extraordinarily sensitive to godliness from the day it was born? Is it any wonder 
No, it's not a wonder. But it could happen that that an ashama like that could be born into a family of very coarse, insensitive parents, disrespectful of Hashem, no, no interest in Hashem or Torah and mitzvahs, bichlau. In the first mimer that the Rebbe spoke, said, his very first mimer, he told a story um, of all the Rebbeim. In the middle of the mimer, he began telling stories. It's part of the mimer. Well, you'll learn it. The month of Shvat, you'll learn it. And the very easy part of the mimer is when he's telling stories. The stories are easier to deal with. But it's, it's a great mimer. You'll love it. You'll it's, it contains fundamental ideas of our, our Jewish life and, and, and Yiddishkeit and Hasidus. So he tells a story of all the different rabbis, Rabbeim, the leaders of Chabad, and of their great love for, uh, for the Jewish people. And when he comes to the fourth Rebbe, the Rebbe Shmuel, known as the Rebbe Maharash, We have the Alter Rebbe. His name was Schneer Zalman, right? And then we have his son, who was called the Mittler Rebbe. He wasn't called the Mittler Rebbe in his own time. He was called the Mittler Rebbe after, afterwards. And his name was Dov Bear. He was named after the Rebbe of the Alt Rebbe. That was the Magid. The Magid, his name was Dov Bear. And then we had the Tzemach Tzedek. Tzemach Tzedek, who had the same name as our Rebbe, Menachem Mendel. And he was married to the, the, the his wife had the same name as our Rebbetzin, Chaya Mushka, Musya. So once the Tzemach Tzedek became Rebbe, so then the, the Rabbi Dover became the Mittler Rebbe, one in between. And then his youngest son, he had many sons, they all became Rebbes, but not the Rebbes of Chabad. One who took over the leadership after the Tzemach Tzedek was his youngest son, the only one who was born while he was Rebbe. The others were born before he was Rebbe. So that's Rebbe Shmuel. And uh, it's a very interesting biography. This biography, if you get a hold of it, it's in the library, you should read it. Fascinating story. Stories of his life, Rebbe Maharash. He was the shortest lived of all the Rebbeim, and he knew he, he had he was he, he he knew that he didn't have a lot of time in life, and everything he did was quick and and short because he didn't have time. And the story that the Rebbe tells about him in this first mimer, and he, yeah, the Rebbe Maharash, is the story that he tells is how one day he picked himself up and he took a couple of secretaries, and they went to Paris. It's a long way from Lubavitch to Paris. And obviously for a person, a meditative person, it's very difficult to fulfill your daily obligations on a train. And he went there, he went to Paris and the Rebbe tells the story how he went to the most expensive hotel, which was frequented by kings and princes, the wealthiest of the wealthy, the upper, upper, upper. And there was a casino in the hotel. Now, this was before elevators were invented, just before in the 1840s, just before elevators. That's when the Eiffel Tower was built and the Eiffel Tower had the first elevator. It was a big novelty. People lined up to get in the elevator to go up high to see what Paris looked like from the Eiffel Tower. And he went, he checked into this hotel, which cost a fortune. And he sent the secretaries to stay in a different hotel, which was not less expensive. 
And he, he spoke French. He was very worldly in that sense. He even made fun of one of his secretaries who didn't know how to speak French. And he asked for a room on the same floor as the casino, which was the, you know, a casino is a gambling place, which was the most expensive floor. And after he got himself settled in his room that evening, he went into the casino and there was a young man, very handsome young man, sitting, playing cards, gambling. I can presume, doesn't say so, but I can presume that there were women around. And there was definitely wine on the table. And in walks this rabbi. <coughs> can imagine the scene. You know, this debonair young guy, really classy <coughs> person on the cutting edge of everything. Wealthy, loaded, gambling, very high stakes, drinking wine is what rich people do. And in walks this rabbi in his long black cloak with a, maybe he's wearing a black hat, I'm sure he's wearing a yarmulke. And he comes into the, everybody, people sort of, did they look, did they not look, did they feel, how do they feel, did it make them feel uncomfortable? How would you feel? You know? And imagine being at a ball where everybody's dancing together, men and women are dancing together, and in walks a rabbi. Where well, rabbis don't dance together with their wives. You have a machitza. And how do you feel? It's rabbi standing watching this. So how do you think these people felt? They felt a little funny. And he, he stands behind this guy who's gambling, and he watches him, how he's gambling. And then, and in and, and a break, I guess when they're reshuffling the cards or doing whatever they do in a break, he steps forward and says in French, young man, it must have been in French, doesn't say he said it in French, but it must have been in French. He says, young man, non-kosher wine will make your heart insensitive and it will confuse your mind. Be a Jew. Looks up. Did he hear correctly? Is that what he said? He's shocked. And the Rebbe repeats himself. He says, young man, non-kosher wine is going to make your heart insensitive and is going to confuse your brain. Be a Jew. And he steps back. And he is so excited. He's very, very um, excited. And he sits down in the first chair that he sees, which happens to be the elevator chair, because in that hotel, they didn't have elevators. They had servants. And when the rich people sat down in this chair, they would carry them up the steps to their room. And they lift the guy, they lift him up, to take him to his room. He feels himself being lifted up, highly symbolic. And no, 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 he says, I didn't mean to sit in this chair. You can put me down. I can go by myself to my room. And he goes to his room. Later that night, the same young man comes and knocks on the door and uh, he ends up speaking with the Rebbe through the night. And, and uh, the Rebbe did the job. He cleaned out his neshama. He cleaned it out and he became a Torah observant, a head of an outstanding Jewish family in Paris for generations to come. This is the story the Rebbe told in the very first Mimer. Why am I telling you this story now? Because this illustrates the point that we just learned at the end of chapter two, that a very, very high neshama can come down into a family that has no connection with Yiddishkeit whatsoever. Here, the family were, were maybe sensitive to, in a certain worldly sense, but in terms of Yiddishkeit, they were very insensitive. And it can be even not just insensitive, it can be very coarse and low, with low interests and low desires and low language and, and low passions and low behavior. I think we even mentioned the idea that you could have even people who are gangsters, 
high neshamas, holy neshamas. You know, Las Vegas was built by a gangster, a Jewish gangster, Bugsy Newman. The gang eliminated him, I guess, because it cost so much. He had this dream of building a sin city in the middle of the desert where people could come and indulge in all the sins they wanted to. It was a brilliant idea. And of course, it made tons, it's made tons and tons of money, but it cost a lot of money to build it. And I guess it was all on loan from the mafia and he wasn't paying back fast enough and they, they killed him. He was a wild, <coughs> wild, young Jewish guy. Brilliant. Very high neshama. I'm sure a very high neshama. So that's what he's saying, that sometimes a very high neshama can come down into a course family. There's a note from the Rebbe here that explains why this would be. He says, but sometimes a neshama could fall into the clutches of, of the other side, the wicked side of wickedness and evil. Why? Maybe he did something was unjust. Maybe he was a rav and he made a decision that wasn't right and, and caused people to suffer because <clears throat> he was too harsh with a widow and, or whatever it might've been. The person he should have had mercy on her, and he was very harsh with her, and therefore he was condemned. He was he fell into the clutches of the other side, uh, of the the negative side of life, and and they hold on to they hold on to this neshama. They don't let it go. This is what the Rebbe says. This is this is this is I, I don't know if it's Kabbalah or mysticism, what it is, but this this it's brought down in the Tanya. That they will sometimes release this neshama, very holy neshama, and allow it to come back into the world, or re be reincarnated in a very low, low environment, with the hope that the neshama, young kid, right, is a young kid with a very high neshama, influenced by his friends, his environment, his his colleagues, you know, they're all into whatever. So he gets into it also, whatever. I knew a guy, I know him, he's still, he's alive, friendly guy. He was at the university that I, where I, where I went on, on Shlichus. And uh, he was a, he was a hotshot guy, very, very handsome, very with it. He was musical. He, his parents were survivors of the Holocaust and probably from holy generations. And he got into drugs. He was pushing drugs. You've heard of the Rolling Stones? Yeah, big rock group from the 70s. He was, he traveled with them and he got busted. He was, he was gonna go to jail and he was very, very upset. And he came to the Chabad rabbi on campus and what do I do? Because he'd come for Shabbos. He, he, he spoke Yiddish. He, he was very familiar with, with, with Torah but he'd come into a low environment and he'd end up in big trouble and he stopped the Rebbe. The, you can see the, the gem interview, you, you can see it. You can read a fascinating interview, how on a freezing cold winter's day, he stopped the Rebbe and they spoke in the freezing cold outside of 770. And he says, where is the Abish? Where is the Abish? Rebbe says, where you let him in. He became a Balchuba. He, when he got out, he, he, he invested his money very wisely. The money he made, he invested wisely. He bought like which, Richmond Hill in these areas when they were farmland uh, outside of Buffalo. You know? And when he, he, when he was released, he came to look at his properties and he met another guy there, also a Jewish guy, a Russian guy. And they became partners and they developed, they, they became very, very prominent businessman in the real estate business. And, and of course he, he became very, he became from his children are all in yeshiva. But that's an example of what it says in the Tanya of how a very high neshama can end up in a family uh, where the, the standards are not very high because what does, what, and it says, it says in the Tanya because the hope the 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 Yetzirah hopes that by releasing this very high neshama, he'll become a very high gangster, and he'll use out all his talents, and so the Yetzirah will get a lot more out of the investment. It's an investment. The Yetzirah takes a chance. 
that it's going to reap a lot of benefit through all the sins that will be initiated by this high neshama. Okay? That's our class for today. Time is up. <laughs> Questions, comments, appreciation. Rabbi, stop telling stories. Let's do more text. Like what? Like you like the stories. <laughs> yes, Miss um, Milligan. So the stories are like about part of the text. Like I have a hard time not following what's the Tanya like text and what's the story. Ah, so so yeah. Like I tried to do Tanya and like I just sort of gave up. <laughs> You what? You tried to what? Like I tried following along, but like I guess I'm just wondering if the way that you're approaching it is like you're showing what the Tanya is saying through a story. Yes, <clears throat> the story illustrates what the Tanya is talking about. So the Tanya taught us. First of all, we learned quick summary, chapter one, that there are many, many every there are many levels of the neshama. We have to understand what does it mean that the five different categories, the tzaddik, the rasha, two categories of the tzaddik, two categories of the rasha, and a benini, and what do these categories mean? And then we learned that every person has two neshamas, and these neshamas, we can, they're redefined as nefashas and nefesh. There's a, and then he talks about in the first chapter, the nefesh from the other side. We had this marshal of the spider, right? The one, every good thing has an opposite counterpart from the other side. The godly soul is interested in God and good things, and the animal soul is interested in pleasure, self-satisfaction. And we learned that there are four elements that make up everything. Everything, every physical thing is made up of these four elements. They are fire, water, air, earth. And spiritually, the soul also has these elements. And we learned what are these four elements? How do they express the animal soul? How does the animal soul express itself in, the, in a manner of fire, like by anger, in an, animal, in an element of water, in a manner of water, like through lust and passion and desire for pleasurable foods and hanging around on the beach and things like that. And how does it express itself through the elements of air and the animal soul? Through talking too much and saying not nice things and saying bad things. Politics. And through earth, earthiness and the animal soul, it leads to depression and melancholy and lethargy, lethargy heaviness okay and then we learned we talked about how the opposite side how these four elements would express themselves in the godly soul then we moved into chapter two with the idea that the, every person has a holy neshama from the essence of godliness we learned two mashalim one marshal was how a person blows from deep within it says god blew a soul into adam and the second marshal was how a child is connected to the essence the essential life of the father the essential life of the father is expressed comes into the father and the highest level of the highest intellect because your intellect is the highest aspect of your of your spiritual being and the highest level of the high of the intellect that's where the neshama touches base with you and then spreads out from there down through the whole system of your life and we extended this metaphor of a birth of a child, how a child is born and is connected to the creative drop, the seminal drop throughout its development as a fetus. And then even after it's born, it still remains connected with this highest element of life in the father. And we extended this to the, great, the overall history of the Jewish people, that this applies also to how all the Jewish souls get their life from Hashem. Starting with the, the fathers of the Jewish people, who are Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Sar, Rivka, Rahaleya, the mothers. 
And just like the child remains connected to his father after it's born, we are all, we remain connected to our to, to our fathers and mothers. And this applies not only to the great body of the Jewish people that spans all the centuries, but in every generation, we have the heads of the generation and the hearts of the generation and the feet and the legs of the generation, which are the ordinary masses of people. And then we, this applies also to you as an individual. You have your higher, the higher aspects of your soul and the lower aspects of your soul. The holy side and the not and the selfish side, self-centered side. Okay. And this is where we concluded now with the idea that not only you have a holy soul, but you also have to have garments of the soul. And these garments are, you get when you're born and you have to work on them and, and make them more and more, make them and refine them throughout your lifetime. And these garments are in three general categories, which are thought, speech and action. And we're dealing now with the very, with the idea that sometimes a very, very high soul can be born into a family with very crude, coarse, undeveloped garments. <clears throat> we will continue with this idea, with the idea of the garments introduction, we're introducing the idea of the garments in the third, third chapter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.